Okay, good morning everyone. Before we begin, we'll take a quick tour around our presentation room. Please note that we have now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback. You are now being recorded. Beginning in the top right, you'll find a list of participants. If you run into any technical issues during the presentation, hover your mouse over my name, Dan Wilton, and a menu will appear to send me a private chat message. Below the participant list is the chat area. The chat is public and is recorded. Here you can post your responses to anything that might come up during the presentation. It's also an opportunity for the microphone shy to post questions to our presenter at the end of the talk. The main window is the projection screen for the slides, and above that you'll find a button showing a person with a raised hand. That's a pull-down menu for making the session more interactive with options for a smiley or applause. After the presentation, we'll release the microphone for questions. To use your microphone, click the microphone button next to the little man once to begin speaking and again to disconnect when you've finished your question. Do remember to keep your microphone off when you're not speaking to avoid any feedback or background noises. And here we go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first spring session of the CIDR 2017 series from the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning and the Center for Distance Education at Athabasca University. As our regular audience members will know, we have over the years tended to focus on post-secondary education research. Recently, however, we have begun to correct that bias and give research into the world of K-12 education greater attention, including the addition of a new program for K-12 teachers here at Athabasca. Thanks to today's guests, however, we have been very fortunate to have an ongoing mini-series, an annual tradition of state-of-the-nation reports on K-12 online learning in Canada reminding us that distance education reaches all ages in all regions of the country. Our speakers today are Dr. Michael Barbour, Associate Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Sciences at Touro University in Vallejo, California, and Dr. Randy Labonte, Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian eLearning Network, or CAN eLearn in British Columbia. Dr. Barbour holds a PhD in Instructional Technology and a Certificate in Adult Education from St. Francis Xavier. His background, however, is rooted in the secondary level, and he has been involved with K-12 online and blended learning in a variety of countries for almost two decades as a researcher, teacher, course designer, and administrator. Dr. Barbour's research focuses on the effective design, delivery, and support of K-12 online learning particularly for students located in rural jurisdictions. In recent years, he has advocated for policies designed to promote effective forms of K-12 online and blended learning. Dr. Labonte, in addition to his role at the Canadian eLearning Network, has served as a senior level executive for over 30 years in the education sector. He was the lead consultant for seven years at the BC Ministry of Education involved in field work leading to the development of policy agreements and e-learning standards. He helped develop, pilot, and implement the quality review process for BC online K-12 schools, and you'll find he is passionate about online and technology-supported blended learning. Before I hand things over to today's guests, just a quick reminder to everyone about our next CIDR session at the same time next week, March 29th, where we will continue our look into K-12 research with Connie Blomgren, Verena Roberts, and special guests launching their new project of podcasts and videos on open educational resources in K-12 education. Be sure to watch our site at cider.athabascau.ca as we announce additional spring sessions with guests including Randy Garrison, Marty cleveland Dennis, and Gerald Ardito. You will also find these slides and a recording of this session at our site in about two hours. I am now passing the microphone to Drs. Barbour and Labonte. Feel free to use your applause buttons here. Everyone, welcome Drs. Michael Barbour and Randy Labonte. Hello, everyone, and thank you for that introduction, Dan. Um, for most of the session here, I'm going to be uh, taking the lead on most of the formal presentation, and uh, Randy will join in um, as things come up. 
Um, as many of you know, this is a study that we've been doing for quite some time. Um, this coming year uh, will actually be the 10th year uh, that we have been doing it. And as you can see from the covers here on the slide, um, the first five years we were um, sponsored or partnered with uh, what originally was the North American Council for Online Learning and eventually became the International Association for K-12 Online Learning. Um, NACL or INACL and um, then for a couple of years actually the final year that INACL was uh, the um, publisher as well as the first year without them um, which would be I guess the first red cover you see on the second row there. Uh, Open School BC were the, the publishers and for the last three years uh, since the creation of the Canadian eLearning Network or Can e Learn, um, which uh, Randy is the CEO of um, it's Can e Learn has been uh, the sponsor for uh, these publications and uh, really one of the, the main reasons why I, I've continued to do this as long as I have, I think. Um, and uh, so this coming year actually will be the 10th year and we're kind of excited about some of the new things we hope to add to the 2017 report. But uh, before we get there, because we're just starting the the process of collecting sponsors and uh, beginning the data collection. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about the uh, 2016 report. Uh, but before I get into that, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the fact that every single year that we've done this, um, it wouldn't have been possible without a collection of sponsors that we have. And, and many of these sponsors have been long-term sponsors. So for the last three years, uh, the Manitoba First Nations Educational Resource Center uh, have been responsible for all the copy editing, formatting, and the actual publishing of the physical report. As I mentioned, Can you Learn has been a partner with us throughout that time. Um, organizations like Learn and Heritage Christian Online Schools have been uh, sponsors with the report for the last five or six years, as has the Virtual High School in Ontario, which has sponsored the report for the last four or five years. And the British Columbia Teachers Federation has also sponsored specific research that we've conducted as part of the State of the Nation project on two or three occasions now. So we thank them for all of that. So um, if you are curious about the project and want to learn more about it in general beyond just the details I provide today, I'd encourage you to go to the project website, uh, which is available at k12sotn.ca uh, or stateofthenation.ca. Uh, and um, there you'll find uh, profiles for each of the provinces uh, from not just the current year, from all the past years. You'll find all of the nine previous reports that are there. Uh, you'll notice we keep a blog going that's uh, related to the items. Um, in addition to that, we're actually in the process now of starting some special issue reports. Uh, the first one is actually one that the BCTF has um, uh, created or has sponsored, I should say, that's looking at the legislative language around online and blended learning that is in collective agreements across the country. And I'm also working with uh, one of Dan's colleagues at the Athabasca University. Um, we're looking at um, what teacher education programs across Canada are doing when it comes to uh, K-12 online and blended learning. So those are two sp subject-specific reports that will appear on the uh, website hopefully in the next 12 months. Um, so looking at the national report, as I've mentioned, we've been doing this for nine years and oh, during that nine year period, we've actually had the opportunity to sort of develop relationships across the country, not just with um, officials in the ministries of education in each of the provinces, territories, as well as uh, schools that fall under federal jurisdiction, which are mainly your First Nations, Métis and Inuit schools, or Inuit schools, sorry. Um, but we've also developed a, a network of key stakeholders throughout the country. And uh, it's the key stakeholders actually that have been quite useful as we've been collecting a lot of the data because in many cases, while the ministry uh, has to uh, provide a, a certain amount of information, uh, like most government agencies, they always want to put a specific uh, face on the material that's being provided. and depending on the nature of the jurisdiction, in some cases they have more or less data on what is actually happening within the distance online and blended learning environment. Uh, some jurisdictions have a great deal of data. 
Um, others have no data whatsoever. And depending on what aspect of distance online and blended learning you're asking about, the level of data and understanding of what is actually happening on the ground varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And that's actually one of the biggest challenges that we've had over the years. So as you can see, for the most part, one of the things that um, you'll note is, generally speaking, we rely pretty heavily upon the ministries of education for the information that we they've provided to us. Uh, oftentimes, we'll push back uh, as we get that that data to try to ascertain what's going on. Um, what we tend to include here are where the majority of the information for each of the provincial profiles and the national uh, data that we get come from. Um, I could put key stakeholders or KS in every single one of these cells for every single year, and that would actually be accurate. Um, the times in which we have included them there are times in which we've had to rely upon them more heavily than others. So looking across the country sort of on a, a national level, this is sort of what the picture looks like across Canada when it comes to at least the type of programs that we have in existence. And this is primarily for your online or distance programs. Uh, and you'll see uh, a couple of trends that are developing here. Uh, the first, obviously, is within Atlantic Canada. Um, one of the things that you'll note is that the vast majority of provinces, actually everyone except for Prince Edward Island, um, has a, uh, a single province-wide program. And then as you move uh, westward, you have a variety of things happening, although in many cases, a lot of that depends upon the nature of their development. Um, if you were to go back, say, 10, 15, 20 years, um, particularly sort of at the advent of the online systems, every single province there would be in red. Um, when you look at a lot of the legacy models of distance education, uh, for the most part, with a couple of exceptions, they were all run out of the ministries of education or through some arm's length agency that the ministry had tapped. Um, and sort of as a lot of the online programs have developed, we've seen a, a history of, of change happen in, in each of these provinces. Now, one of the things that we often do in this presentation is we sort of go province by province and talk about the level of activity and, and the nature of programs in those. And um, if you're interested in that, really, the website, as Randy's been pointing to in, in the uh, chat there is the place to go and specifically the last link that he put there uh, when you click on that you'll get an interactive map of Canada which allows you to sort of click on any province territory or the federal jurisdiction and see exactly what's happening there what we want to do today is provide sort of more of a, a regional overview so we're going to go through a, a variety of regions and we've cut them up um, in ways that sort of make a little bit of sense to us so as I mentioned Atlantic Canada with the exception of Prince Edward Island, has single province-wide programs. Uh, so what ends up happening is that there is a program that is run out of the Ministry of Education. Um, in the case of, of Newfoundland, it's called the Centre for Distance Learning. Nova Scotia has the Nova Scotia uh, Virtual Public School, or sorry, Public Virtual School. Sorry, Nova Scotia Virtual School. Um, in the case of New Brunswick, uh, it's a single program run out of the ministry that doesn't have a specific name, but there are sort of two divisions within it. There's a Francophone division and an Anglophone division, uh, New Brunswick being a officially bilingual province. Uh, PEI is sort of the one that's left out in this kind of model because uh, they actually don't have a distance ed program, at least internally anymore. Uh, they buy space in New Brunswick program and have now for about the last three years. Uh, prior to that, they did actually have a small video conferencing-based program that was used primarily for uh, French as a second language, at least in recent years, although prior to that it would have been used for uh, some of the more advanced math courses as well as some of the more advanced science courses uh, to a couple of the rural schools. But um, the, the fact of the matter was that the vast majority of, of uh, students weren't using this. It was actually a very low enrolled program. The last year that they had, they only had a single course with a dozen or so students that were involved. Um, and even in the capacity that they currently buy from New Brunswick right now, um, most of that is are in the Francophone programs as opposed to the Anglophone programs, at least in a proportional sense. 
um, in terms of the nature of regulation in each of these jurisdictions, um, there isn't specific uh, guidance within the Schools Act or the Education Act in any of these jurisdictions. Uh, the fact that the programs are run for the ministries of education, or at least through an arm's length agency in the case of sort of the um, the Nova Scotia Virtual School and the uh, Newfoundland Center for Distance Learning and Innovation means that the ministry has the ability to exert a fair amount of direct control over these programs. And it's also worth noting that in the case of Nova Scotia, the Nova Scotia Teachers Union actually has a uh, s specific series of clauses within their collective agreement that govern various aspects of distance education. Uh, this is something we've looked at in great detail in previous versions of the report, um, as well as one of the special reports that we've done for the British Columbia Teachers Federation uh, in the past. Uh, but it looks at issues really that affect um, the things that make delivering distance education a little bit different than what you would see in a face-to-face -face environment. So for example, one of the um, issues that you would expect an online or blended teacher to experience is the simple fact that the technology is changing all the time, uh, much more so than a lot of the technology that a more traditional classroom teacher would have. Uh, one of the clauses within the uh, collective agreement related to distance education is additional specific professional development. Um, you know, there are issues in there around class size, recognizing the fact that teaching online often takes more time uh, than teaching in a face-to-face -face environment. Similarly, uh, there's a, a provincial committee in there that looks at distance ed policy that has representation from a variety of stakeholders, and each of those are sort of outlined within the collective agreement. Moving westward, and I always like to start on the East Coast just because I'm a native Newfoundlander myself, um, Quebec is, is the next one we come across. And Quebec is an interesting jurisdiction because it's one of those where prior to 1995, it had a single province-wide ministry-run distance ed program. And in 95, the ministry decided that they were going to get out of uh, the business of providing distance education and devolved it to the school boards. And what's happened now is that you have a, a variety of organizations in there from uh, ones that provide primarily correspondence education like SOFED to others that are doing um, some more synchronous distance ed or blended learning uh, environments like LEARN. Um, and they're partnering with school districts uh, to provide these kinds of, of programs. Uh, in addition to that, you also have some districts that are managing their own distance ed programs. So it's, it's a real sort of uh, combination of, of things occurring within the province. And um, it, it's a really sort of unregulated development uh, that we've seen over the last 20 years within the province of Quebec. Uh, looking at the province of Ontario, um, it's a, a little bit different in that it's sort of gone uh, the opposite direction. You know, they have the Independent Learning Center, which is a province-wide correspondence-based program that has been in existence for decades now. Uh, but in the mid-90s, you had a number of district-based programs that were starting to develop sort of organically on their own. And one of the um, things that after a few years of this happening... Um, there were probably about a dozen, dozen and a half of these programs in existence before the ministry finally sort of, you know, looked around and said, you know, there's a fair amount of things happening here. We should really try to get a sense of this. And they began seconding a lot of the uh, main players that were in these uh, prevent these district-based programs to the ministry uh, to help them essentially develop a provincial e-learning strategy, which eventually came about. And um, it's been that provincial e-learning strategy that has really guided a lot of the development that we've seen in Ontario since. So um, essentially what happens is the ministry has a, a province-wide learning management system license that they provide to uh, the district. So uh, all the teachers and the students are able to access the learning management system for free. They also have created um, content for all of the courses, which they then provide to the districts for free. Uh, now, the districts are responsible for running their own distance education programs. They just have these ministry tools and this ministry content that they are able to use. Um, and in theory, they're supposed to 
if you have students from one district that want to enroll in another district's distance ed program or online program, uh, they're supposed to charge each other a per course fee. Although uh, one of the things that we've seen happening uh, within the province is a lot of the district-based programs have joined into these consortiums uh, that essentially agree to cooperate when it comes to this distance ed. Uh, the other thing that you've got in this system is because you've got all of this online content and you've got this province-wide LMS, it allows for a lot of blended learning to happen. And this is something that the ministry has actually done, I think, an exceptional job in terms of their ability to support this kind of thing. They've funded um, and they've had different terms over the years, e-learning coordinators, distance learning coordinators. I think they're called technology-enabled learning coordinators now. Um, but they've been essentially putting them in each of the school boards across the uh, province and um, or at least within specific regions, depending upon which of the, the terms you've uh, had. And those individuals have been responsible for essentially encouraging uh, the use of online and blended learning at the board level. Um, and, you know, these are ministry funded and ministry supported personnel that are in these positions. So it's been a real sort of uh, interesting model that we've had here and uh, one where we've seen you know a, a great deal of, of blended learning happening and, and that has happened to a lesser extent in Atlantic Canada with these provincial programs uh, where you've got a single provincial program that has a single LMS that um, you know all the schools are using that have all of this course content you've seen these uh, jurisdictions also have an increase in blended learning as well um, Moving westward across the, the prairies, um, essentially each of these jurisdictions have had sort of similar developments. In all three of these cases, what you've had is uh, very similar to what you've had in Quebec, where you've had a single province-wide program at one point in time, and that was at one stage the only game in town. And as sort of the e-learning has developed over the last 20 to 25 years, uh, you've seen that sort of evolve in different kinds of ways. Um, in the case of Manitoba, they still manage a uh, uh, essentially a, a television-mediated program. Uh, at the provincial level, they also manage a, um, a correspondence program at the provincial level. Uh, in addition to that, they have a number of district-based programs uh, that are primarily web-based or uh, primarily online, although they call them web-based courses. And in most of these cases, it is a model similar to what we were just describing in Ontario, where um, you know the province is providing content to the districts and the districts are running their own program. Um, interestingly, they've actually had in the past uh, couple of years uh, these virtual school pilots that they've started off, the first one was actually uh, the Wapaskawa Virtual Collegiate, uh, which is the one run by the Manitoba First Nations Resource Center, um, with the idea of looking at the possibility of these virtual collegiates, uh, the pilots that they've been running as a way of creating these province-wide virtual schools. Um, Saskatchewan, again, if you were to go back, even within since we've begun uh, collecting data for this study nine years ago had a primarily a single province-wide program. Uh, about five years ago now, they basically, similar to Quebec, decided to get out of the game altogether at the provincial level and provided districts with bridge funding, uh, which was designed to either build their own capacity or allow them to purchase capacity in other programs. And when the province decided to sort of get out of the game, there was already... Uh, 12 to 16 online programs that had developed throughout uh, the province. Um, Alberta, again, a similar story. You've had the ADLC, which I see Randy has uh, posted the uh, link for. And I know we've got a couple of guys in the room that are part of uh, the program. Um, you know, they've been around for decades, like um, the Independent Learning Center, like SOFET. Um, initially, a correspondence-based program that's evolved into a program that has a variety of services from still providing some traditional correspondence to providing some robust online learning. And um, for a while, and I'm sure Verena may mention this next week, uh, at least for a short period of time, even playing around with MOOCs within the K-12 environment. Um, you know, at the same time, we've got between a dozen and a half and two dozen district-based programs that we see 
that have developed uh, throughout the province, some of which are focused more upon online learning, some of which seem to be moving more towards a, a blended learning kind of model. And uh, it's interesting to note that in the case of these three provinces, uh, similar to Quebec in this way, there isn't really any regulations around online learning, at least above and beyond what would be expected of classroom-based learning. Uh, so much like we see south of the border in the United States where uh, the online or virtual programs sort of have to make themselves fit into the brick and mortar box, uh, that's often what happens in, in these kinds of environments as well, at least in these three provinces uh, as well in Quebec. Now, when we move furthest to the west in, in Randy's neck of the woods in British Columbia, um, that regulatory issue goes out the window because uh, really for the last decade or so, uh, British Columbia has actually had a legislative regulatory regime around uh, online learning so that um, there is a section of the Schools Act as well as a corresponding section of the Independent Schools Act that talks about online learning or actually what they would refer to as distributed learning. And in that case, or in those cases, I should say, uh, what ends up happening is that um, essentially all of the programs, and there are roughly 70, um, I think it's 72 this past year, uh, 60 public ones and 12 private ones, if I remember correctly. Um, that um, are governed by this uh, environment. The other thing that's happening within this regulatory environment is that the funding is actually broken up. In, so instead of being a full FTE that goes to the student's home district, it's actually broken up into units based upon the number of courses that the student takes. So that if a student is taking, say, two courses uh, in their home district and two courses from one online program and then two courses from a different online program, each of those three entities would share a third of the student's FTE. Uh, so essentially the funding follows the student based upon who is providing uh, that particular chunk of education as uh, we're going through. And um, I think the funding model that we see here is one of the reasons why British Columbia historically, at least since we've been doing the report, has also been the jurisdiction that's had the highest level of um, proliferation of distance learning or distributed learning uh, throughout the province. Um, really, since we've started tracking this, they've tended to be about twice what the national average is uh, and usually well ahead of most other jurisdictions. Um, looking at sort of the last region of Canada, this is uh, uh, the northern portions of Canada, and I've, I haven't mentioned the First Nations programs, uh, although I will reference them in a second. Um, the northern territories are an interesting model because uh, probably more so than any of the other jurisdictions we've looked at, distance education is something that really they would most benefit from given the size and scope of the geography that they're trying to cover. Uh, what's interesting is that for the most part, they haven't really taken advantage of these distance programs. Um, so one of the things that you've seen in all of these jurisdictions is that for the most part, they're using uh, programs that are based in the southern provinces. In the case of Nunavut and the Northwest Territories, the vast majority of distance education or online learning that's being provided is actually coming from the, the Alberta Distance Learning Center. Um, in the case of British Columbia, while it's a decreasing number, there's still a significant number of students involved in online uh, and distance learning from programs based in BC, as well as the ADLC again. Um, now, in the case of no, or the Northwest Territories and the Yukon, one of the things that we've seen in recent years is that they've begun to pilot their own internal programs. And actually, I think with the 2017 report, I'm going to have to check with the, the ministry folks in, in the Yukon on this, but I think with the 2017 report, we'll actually finally be able to turn um, the Yukon from that sort of striped green uh, meaning that they're piloting their own aspect to actually uh, being one of the other colors. In this case, it'll probably be either red or possibly the light blue as opposed to the purplish color um, because they have an Aurora virtual school, which they've been piloting over the last couple of years. And then they also have a number of district-based blended programs that they've been 
uh, piloting um, really for, I guess, the last three years now. Uh, in the case of the Northwest Territories, it's really the Beaufort Delta Education Council in partnership with uh, the department there that has been providing that particular pilot. Um, so that'll give you sort of a sense as to kind of what's happening in terms of the nature of activity and uh, to a lesser extent, the nature of regulation. But when you look at the actual numbers of students involved, and this gets back to my comment about sort of the, the proliferation that we see in British Columbia. Um, you know, this is sort of a province by province look um, at what's happening uh, right across the country. So as you can see, the first column there just gives you the total number of K-12 students that are involved within schooling in the province, and then you get the number that's involved in some form of distance learning, be it the traditional correspondence or online or what have you. Uh, and then you can see sort of the percent of K-12 students that are actually involved in distance education, online learning in that particular province. Um, and in most cases, you'll see there's several there, I guess they're kind of grouped. Uh, you've got a bunch that are in that one to two percent range. Um, including places like Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, well, PEI is well below that, uh, New Brunswick, so Atlantic Canada, and then essentially the north, for the most part, are sort of in that 2 to 3 percent, 1 to 2 percent kind of range. Um, then you've got another group that are in that 4 to 6 percent range, and that's really, um, you know, from Quebec through to uh, Saskatchewan. So essentially, you know, that middle part of the country, if you will, central Canada and the prairies. Uh, then you've got this group that are at the upper end of the spectrum, and that really is Alberta and BC. And historically, that's sort of been where they are. Um, you know, BC has always been at the top. In recent years, as we've been getting better numbers, uh, Alberta has been, at least in terms of a proportional way, um, similar to that. So here's a, a similar figure, similar chart, but it looks at the last three years just in terms of the number of distance ed students and then the percentage of students that are involved in distance online and distance learning as you're looking at. So you can see that in, in some jurisdictions, like Newfoundland as an example, the number of students involved have been steadily increasing. Um, in other cases, so I'm looking at places like uh, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, um, we've seen sort of a variance, if you will, uh, where some years it's up, some years it's down. Um, but when you look at sort of the overall percentage points, it's been, you know, in terms of the percentage involvement, fairly consistent as we've looked at uh, that particular time. Um, one of the interesting things is, and um, Randy may want to speak to this a little bit, or at least um, talk about it in, in the chat as he's been quite active there. Um, you'll notice that British Columbia has actually decreased significantly. In, in the past year, almost 9,000, 8,500, 9,000 students that we've seen there. And I think one of the reasons for that um, is we've seen a great increase in the number of students that are taking uh, blended courses from these online programs. And uh, I know Randy is quite familiar with and has talked about it a number of times uh, programs like the Navigate program that is uh, run out actually in his neck of the woods, I believe, out in Victoria, if I'm remembering um, correctly on that. And, um, you know, so as you're looking at these kinds of things, thank you, Randy Courtney. Um, and um, one of the reasons for that may be that online students are funded at a slightly lower level than what face-to-face -face students are funded. Uh, so the FTE for a distance student in British Columbia is slightly lower than what the FTE for a face-to-face -face student is. And based upon the provincial regulations, um, if a student is 51% distance, they are considered a distributed learning student. If they are 49% distance, they are considered a face-to-face -face student. Um, and I think that's some of what you're seeing there. Um, you'll also notice, you'll see a significant decrease in Alberta as well by about 15,000 students. And I'm not sure if that's an actual decrease in the number of students involved, or if it's just the fact that we've been getting better numbers as time has gone on uh, when we've been looking at this. And I'll get to the numbers, uh, you know, this idea of better numbers in a second. Um, but one of the things that you'll note is that in the past year, uh, we've seen, in all honesty, the first real decrease in the total numbers. So if you sort of look at 
the percentage of students across the country that have been engaged in uh, online and distance learning uh, since we've been actually keeping track. Um, 2015, 2016 was the first time that we've seen a decrease in that number. Um, some of that may have been actually a lower number of students that were actually involved in distance education, but some of it also might have been the fact that we've been getting better at, at both estimating and at um, collecting um, numbers from either the ministries themselves or from the individual programs. Um, one of the things that I would caution as you look at this, um, you know, the first couple of years we have here, we've, you know, put a tilde in front of the items to indicate that they were approximately those numbers. Um, and then in 2009, 2010, we even gave a range, whereas since 2010, 2011, we've given it an exact number. And it would be a mistake to read that as, as being a firm number. Um, in many cases, these are just the best guesses that we have. And for that matter, if you go back to the previous slide and you look at the number of tildes that you see, um, regardless of the year you're looking at, you'll note that um, in many cases, we are making a, a judgment or an estimate or an extrapolation as to the total number of students. And while we think it's a, a pretty good extrapolation, um, you know, to use this past year as a good example, uh, we have almost half of the jurisdictions that we've looked at. And when you're looking at just the sheer numbers, um, more than half of the students that we indicate are involved in distance and online learning um, are based upon numbers that we've extrapolated as opposed to hard and firm numbers that we have. Uh, that becomes even more apparent when we begin looking at the blended learning numbers. Um, and it's only really the last two years that we've begun to actually look at the number of students that are involved in blended learning. And as you can see here, some of these, you know, we can say with a, a fair amount or a fair degree of um, uh, of confidence, uh, I'll use uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and to a lesser extent, Ontario, uh, as examples of this. Um, you know, these were numbers that were provided by the, the ministry. Uh, in most cases, what they represent is the number of unique logins that are based in their provincial learning management system that aren't tied to specifically distance education courses. Um, so the assumption is, is that these students are using the materials in a blended environment. In some cases, essentially, they are ones where we have been able to um, use the information that we've gotten from our individual program survey that we put together each year and have added up all of the numbers that we've seen in that kind of uh, data collection mechanism. Uh, in particular, you'll see that's where we get our numbers from British Columbia, and uh, to a lesser extent, we could add in Alberta into that mix, although um, we would end up with a very small end there, which actually would be you know, less than a percent. Uh, the only place where we actually have a firm, confident number that we can speak of is in the case of uh, the Yukon, and that's because they have these um, specific blended learning pilot programs that they're running directly out of the Department of Education. Um, so one of the things that you know I, I mentioned at the beginning is that uh, while the data and our ability to understand what's happening across the country, and particularly when it comes to activity, is getting better on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, both because we've got a lot more cooperation from uh, the ministries, um, and because we keep asking them for data every single year, in many cases they've actually, because of those requests over time, have begun to pay better attention to it. In all honesty, in many jurisdictions, it's really the individual programs that we've surveyed that um, have provided us with the best information. And uh, here you can see the five years that we've done the individual program survey. Um, the number of programs that were in existence in each of the jurisdictions, and then the response rate for each year. The overall response rate, so the second last column that you see to the right-hand side, 
that refers to the number of unique programs that we have data for. And if you were to go to each of the provincial profiles, one of the things that you'll see is a table that contains the most recent response that we have for every single program that has responded to us over the years in, in these um, particular surveys. And as you can see, in some jurisdictions, we've done fairly well. Those that only have a small number of programs, uh, like Atlantic Canada, like the North, uh, like Quebec, uh, we've tended to be able to get just about everybody to respond to us over time. Um, you notice from year to year, that's not always the case. Uh, but for the most part, we get a response um, eventually. Um, in other cases, you know, if you look at uh, Ontario and Manitoba as good examples, you know, we're getting between a quarter and a third of the programs that exist in those provinces, those jurisdictions, to respond to us at all. Um, and when you're looking at on a year-to-year -year basis, um, you know, so if you look at last year as an example, only five of the 38 school divisions in the, the province actually responded to our request for information about this. Um, so while we have a 24% or roughly a quarter of them that we've heard from over time, um, on an annual basis, um, you know, that number hasn't been all that good. It would be closer to 11% this past year. Um, you know, and that varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, as you can see. Uh, we did fairly well in Alberta this past year uh, with, you know, 11 of the 21 programs, but that's still only half of them that we heard from. Um, and when you sort of look at this uh, over a period of time, uh, in each year, while, you know, the number of programs that we've heard from overall looks pretty good, um, you know, it's a 46% response rate overall, when you look at the five years, when you look at that on a year-to-year -year basis, as you can see, um, in many years, we haven't done that well in terms of hearing about what the programs are actually doing at a particular given time. Um, so one of the biggest challenges that we have with this, and, and one of the things that I always encourage folks uh, when we do these presentations, because I know in many cases the audience happens to be folks that are involved in these particular programs. Um, we always encourage folks that, you know, if you are involved with a, a K-12 online distance or blended program, that we would strongly encourage you to complete the survey. Uh, the survey is always available online at our website, um, and you can go in and see when the most recent data for your particular program is, assuming that we've heard from your program at some point. Um, but it, it's really this kind of thing that's going to allow us to improve the quality of the research that we've been doing from year to year. And um, as Randy mentions in the chat box there, one of the things that um, I think has helped us, because if you look at particularly the past year, you'll see it's not only the highest response rate that we've had, but it's also 20% higher than what it was the previous year. Um, the fact that we now have a pan-Canadian organization, uh, the Canadian eLearning Network, or CanELearn, that is there to advocate for um, distance online and blended learning programs across the country and, and to be a way of connecting those programs um, you know, with each other to help the organization, uh, but also to help the individual programs uh, because challenges that um, one program in Manitoba may be facing in its third year maybe something that a program in British Columbia that's now a decade old has already sort of gone through and struggled with and um, has now sort of come out of the other end of the tunnel, if you will. And while a lot of the things that they did might not be applicable because of the differences in jurisdiction, um, it at least gives them sort of a roadmap as a way of trying uh, different things and, and an opportunity to sort of um, you know, work with a group that's already gone through those things, or for that matter, other organizations that are facing similar problems at that moment. Um, so if, again, if you haven't checked it out in the past, I'd strongly encourage you to, to take a look through our website. Uh, Randy's been posting a lot of the material there as we've been going through with different aspects of it. I know he's been sort of quiet throughout. Uh, that's because I'm the, the chatty one of the two of us. And if you've ever met the two of us in person, you know how wrong that actually is. Um, but um, 
So if you haven't had an opportunity, please go check out the website. And I think we've got about 10 or 12 minutes here for questions uh, from the audience. So I'll release the mic here now. Feel free to take the mic and uh, ask any questions or to uh, post them in the chat box and uh, we will uh, take them as they come. Okay, that's great. And that is, again, Dr. Michael Barbour and uh, Randy Levante in the chat box. It is always great to see the uh, development that's happening in BC, personally. Uh, that's very interesting for me, um, since I was involved in the uh, pilots, early pilots, back around the turn of the century. And to see the changes that have happened since then is, uh, is always great. Okay, yes, we are going to uh, questions and answers. So uh, the microphone has been opened. Um, for anyone who wants to ask a question, uh, feel free to use the microphone button now. Uh, click it once to turn it on. And once you've done with your question, click it again to turn it off to avoid any feedback or echoes. You can also post your question in the chat box. And just a reminder that uh, the slides and the recording of the session um, are available at our site. The recording will be available in about an hour at cider.athabaskeu.ca. Okay, so the microphone is now free for questions. I think I overwhelmed everybody with all the texting and all of the uh, links <laughs> besides what you were presenting with, Michael. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Lisa. Lisa's typing something. Thanks, uh, Denise. Appreciate it. I'm just wondering whether uh, Brian or Frank, if you have anything to add in in terms of information and things that are happening in Alberta that ADLC is involved in or uh, others. Yeah, no, we probably uh, overwhelmed you. This is this is what I found when we had the information on the Candy Learn website was as Michael continued to curate, it just grew and grew and grew and grew, and we went, ooh, that's not very good. So it's. Uh, so it is, and we keep updating, Michael keeps updating the, the information, the sites um, there as well. So uh, if you, uh, yeah, it's, it's just a, a great place. But as noted, um, it's really a struggle to find accurate data on anything related to online learning practices. And then we have classroom teachers that are really moving their practices out into the online spaces. And it's very difficult to track that information as well. It just becomes one mishmash of practices that are both a, a mix of online and uh, classroom based. Uh, that is really makes very interesting pedagogy and very interesting models. But uh, stories and case studies are probably the best way to describe those. Quantitative data is difficult. <laughs> yes, okay. I will take this question, Denise. What do you predict for the future? Um, I think that, uh, that with the pushes and the changes around the curriculum towards a personalized, more learner-centric uh, models, competencies uh, based uh, as well, and where assessment is now less about content and more about skill sets, I think we're going to continue to see a blend, uh, a merging of blending, blended learning. Um, online schools that are strictly at a distance um, are finding more success by building in face-to-face -face learning opportunities and connections with students and families. Uh, classroom teachers are finding the online learning environment to be far more conducive for posting information, content, uh, reviews, and opportunities for students to connect and engage with some of the learning materials and that frees up their time in the classrooms to be more project uh, learner centric uh, oriented. It's not dissimilar that when I started t um, teaching I taught in secondary school and I taught curriculum. I landed in an elementary school when I uh, moved um, to the Vancouver Island and th had to throw all that concept out and I had to teach the kids that were in front of me and so I put them in groups. I gave them individual projects. There were learning centers and stations that I created. Uh, and that's what I see as a similar approach that's happening. And technology enhances and supports teachers' ability to do that. 
Um, I'm very interested to see what Ottawa Catholic School District is doing. They're really heavy into deep learning. Um, they'll be at our uh, Kenny Learn Symposium in April, and there's a session there that Robert Long has been doing, uh, which really describes some of the things that they're doing. Now they're working out of the classroom, but they're working in online learning spaces in order to accomplish some really deep learning. So I see some really good examples of that happening. So that's what I see predicting. Um, and that's not to say that the strictly online and distance learning is going to go away because there's always a need for that. Um, and, you know, ADLC is, <laughs> I'll just tap you, Frank, or Brian, if you want to. Uh, ADLC was predicted to go the way of the dodo bird because it was strictly a distance learning center. And no, it's not. And no, it won't because there's a very strong need for students to pick up courses uh, to complete curriculum uh, outcomes. So, Frank or Brian, do you want to say? Or text it, Mike Shy. We can sh have open mics here, can we, Dan, with more than one talking at a time? Yes, we can. Uh, occasionally we will get some echoes, um, but uh, usually we can deal with that. Go ahead, Frank, if you want to grab the mic. I'm not looking for anything specific, just general comments. More around Denise's comment about what, what do we predict for the future besides growth. I mean, what do you see as the future happening in Alberta? Well, to me, the big thing is around um, is around developing that capacity at a local level. Um, one of the things we're trying to do is roll out the uh, uh, the sort of resources we have into schools so that they can do their own or their own design projects around that. It's easier to have a base and build from it than to try to build something from scratch. So in that sense, that to me is, is where the big opportunity is, is to actually roll this out into the wider teacher audience. Yeah, I, I, I agree as well. And, and I think that I want to just applaud ADLC, who has been doing that in Alberta and offering their resources and support for others. Um, next week's session on OER and the projects and research that was done by uh, Athabasca University as part of that, I think is really important to to go back to your question, Denise, about what the, the, the prediction for the future. Um, one of the the one of the important um, things that are going on and it's happening in post secondary is is open resources and open textbooks. Uh, and BC Campus has led that in combination with eCampus Alberta, which unfortunately is winding up at the end of this month. Um, in, in the post-secondary, but now that David Porter, who was the uh, exec director for BC Campus, he's now the CEO for eCampus Ontario, and is really pushing open textbooks, open learning. Uh, OER resources uh, in provincial jurisdictions, because of the fact that each province has its own sort of education mandate, are more problematic in terms of solving and sharing. But there are consortium models, it, Michael mentioned consortia that are formed, and a lot of it is around sharing technologies, but more importantly, resources that are created. And if we can get provincial governments to the point where they will openly license under Creative Commons some of the materials that are produced within their pure, uh, provincial jurisdictions, I think that will be a game changer and go back to what Frank was saying and building capacity. So that's what I'm really hoping to see uh, will happen in the future and something I want to put my my uh, personal, uh, you know, initiatives behind. While we're Mr. Waiting, Barber, yeah, go ahead. I was going to um, chime in. Uh, I, I have to agree with everything that Randy has said. Um, the only difference, I think, is I'm not, I actually think we're going to see a real decrease in the number of distance and online uh, courses and programs. So I think it will become something that um, is used only when it has to because of geography or scheduling or those kinds of things. Um, what Frank has described with the ADLC I think is going to become the model and these um, drop in centers as Randy alluded to I think are going to become a, a, a bigger deal where if you have a district that is running its own online program because that district or school board is geographically um, defined, 
one of the things that can happen in that kind of environment is you can have a physical presence within that geographic area that um, you know students can come to as needed or can come to on a you know once a week, twice a week, so many hours kinds of basis. Um, kind of like a, a school set up like a Starbucks, if you will. Um, and that kind of model. And, and I think that's one of the things that we're going to see. And we've seen it in the higher ed. You know, there are many more student learning centers on campuses of higher education now than uh, there were 10 years ago. And, and while we're decreasing the sizes and the spending that we have on our traditional libraries, we're increasing the um, spending in terms of building these these kinds of student learning centers. And that's really, I think, what we're going to start to see at the K-12 level as we see this shift from uh, an online distance kind of environment to a more uh, blended, geographically focused kind of model. Yeah, I'll just add one more comment. It'll be interesting to see what happens uh, in British Columbia now that uh, with the Teachers Federation uh, want the Supreme Court to have uh, more uh, class sized language and librarian resources and specialists uh, back in the collective agreement. Now BC is looking at hiring a number of teachers, including librarians. It'll be interesting to see how now in the different pedagogical models that are starting to evolve, whether indeed that that is something that is used to enhance uh, the new pedagogy and new approaches or whether it goes back just into the traditional uh, use of those positions. All right, with about uh, three minutes to go, we have uh, a little bit more time for questions. I see Frank has raised his hand, uh, so if you'd like to go ahead and grab the microphone, uh, go ahead. Let's try this, yeah. Uh, not so much a, a question as a, uh, um, a follow-up to Randy. Um, and the class size issues around British Columbia, we're actually internally at ADLC doing a lot of um, research review right now and also some action research about our own delivery model. And so this is hopefully going to inform a vision of what ADLC looks like in five years time because I think the sort of, the sort of mass delivery that we're doing right now has to adjust given what we're reading in terms of connections between student and content, student and student, student and teacher. And so we're having a really serious look at what the ADLC delivery model is and whether that delivery model needs to, well, should be informed by what we're seeing out of the research. We've got a couple of pilots right now going on in ADLC where teachers are um, working with a, a hard cap uh, of class students and what that does in terms of relationships, what that does in terms of students starting in the, the program and students completing the program. And so whatever is happening in BC, I think, is also um, stretching out across the rest of the country as far as distance ed is concerned. And we're very seriously looking at how those sort of things impact our delivery. Yeah, that's great. And I'm hoping that we see some of that uh, discussion around some of those approaches as well at the April Symposium or at the uh, Blend Ed in October in Alberta. So, Frank, we should see if we can bring some of that connection uh, into one or both of those events. I see Lori has made a, a comment about um, the need for K-12 learners that have had experiences in the online and blended environment coming into universities and what they need to know in terms of the distance education programs uh, that universities are offering. Um, interestingly, Lori, there's actually only been one study that has looked at this. It was one that was done by uh, Dale Kirby and Dennis Sharp in Newfoundland. And oddly enough, one of the things that they found was that the distance, the post-secondary students that had distance learning experience at the K-12 K level 
actually were not as good distance learners in the post-secondary environment as those that did not have experience. Now, some of that's likely due to the fact that the distance program in Newfoundland is uh, a primarily synchronous program that provides a fair amount of support at the local level, which is something that um, most post-secondary distance programs don't provide. Um, so essentially, those students that had no prior experience with distance education didn't have that coddling background, if you will, and coddling expectations. Um, so when that coddling wasn't provided, they were still able to thrive in that environment, whereas the students that had that expectation, um, those were the ones that really uh, had difficulties, if you will. And uh, my bird clock on the wall just uh, sang at me, so we're at the top of the hour, which means we are out of time now. Uh, Randy and I will stick around for a bit if folks have questions, but I'll turn it over to Dan to formally end so that he can um, close up the uh, recording as well. Great. Yes, uh, we will uh, stay open as long as there are questions and people to ask them. Um, but uh, yes, thank you for uh, for everyone to um, to have joined us today and uh, and our guests, um, Michael Barbour and Randy Labonte. Um, for those of you who are interested in K-12, uh, of course, uh, join us again next week, uh, same time, same place, uh, March 29th, for a discussion of uh, Multiply K-12 OER, which is a project of podcasts and video series um, about uh, OER and its use in, in K-12, featuring a number of uh, voices from around the world, including uh, one of our guests today, Randy Labonte. Um, so that will be uh, next week, uh, March 29th, with Connie Blomgren and Verena Roberts. And I see Michael has put his uh, contact information there. Um, yes, you'll also find the slides and a recording of this session at our site at cider.athabasky.ca. All right, and with that, we will uh, formally bring a close to this session and turn off the recording, but we will remain uh, open for any last minute questions as long as our guests are available and uh, we have people to ask them.